Hello, welcome to all. In the previous lecture, we studied about the force acting on a current carrying conductor placed in a magnetic field and we also studied force acting between two parallel conductors and finally we studied about the torque acting on a rectangular current carrying conductor or coil placed in a uniform magnetic field. Okay. Today we will use that concept in the construction of ballistic galvanometer. So today's uh, outline of the lecture is to study the construction and working of the ballistic galvanometer. Okay, right. Yeah, you can see here on the slide the image of a ballistic galvanometer. Okay. Today we will discuss about the construction and the working of a ballistic galvanometer. Okay. Yeah, you are already familiar with the moving coil galvanometer. It is also a moving coil ballistic galvanometer. Okay. You know that uh, you may use uh, the moving coil galvanometer for measuring current and uh, voltages. You may convert uh, the ordinary galvanometer into a, into a voltmeter or ammeter. Into a voltmeter or ammeter. Okay. Now we are going to discuss about ballistic galvanometer. Ballistic galvanometer. Okay, in the today's class, let us discuss about the construction and working of ballistic galvanometer. Yeah. yeah, you may get the doubt that why this ballistic galvanometer is used okay. for what purpose it is used see it is used basically basically it is used to measure the charge displaced over a short period of time this charge is due to the transient currents like uh, um, charging and discharging of capacitor when the charging and discharge discharging of the capacitor takes place and what happens? Transient current passes through the circuit. Okay. What is the meaning of that? Over the short period of time, the current is passing through the circuit. If you want to mean uh, the charge is uh, flowing through the circuit. If you want to measure the quantity of the charge, how much charge is passing through that circuit over the short period of time. Suppose that you want to measure that amount of charge. For that purpose, we use the ballistic galvanometer. Ballistic galvanometer. Okay. How do you measure the charge flowing through the ballistic galvanometer or the charge flowing through the circuit? Here, you note down the deflection in the ballistic galvanometer and you directly relate this deflection of the rectangular coil in the ballistic galvanometer with the charge flowing through that instrument or through that uh, particular circuit where you are interested. Okay, So, the charge flowing through this meter is directly proportional to the deflection of the rectangular coil placed in, inside this ballistic galvanometer. Okay, Let us uh, try to uh, derive this relation. Okay. This we will do as a part of the theory of the ballistic galvanometer. Okay. First of all, let us uh, study about the construction of this ballistic galvanometer. Okay. Yeah, ballistic galvanometer. Okay. 
Yeah. First of all, let us uh, study the construction of it. But on what principle it uh, acts? Let us also see that before going to the construction and working. I already told you that we are using the concept of torque acting in a rectangular coil placed in the uniform magnetic field. Yeah, that is what the principle we use here in this ballistic galvanometer. Okay. And you can see here on the slide. Yeah. You see on the side, slide. See, whenever you place the current carrying rectangular coil in a uniform magnetic field, then what happens? Out of four sides, we have seen in the previous class, and two opposite sides, you see the couple. That means equal and opposite forces acting on those two sides. That causes the rectangular coil to rotate inside the magnetic field. That will, that will cause the rotation of the rectangular coil inside the magnetic field. Okay, right. This is what the principle we use in the ballistic galvanometer. That means in ballistic galvanometer, you have some external field, some permanent field inside that instrument, and there will be one rectangular coil suspended in that uh, uh, uniform magnetic field. Whenever the current passes through that coil, what happens then? The couple acts on that rectangular coil due to the external magnetic field then it starts rotating it rotates for some time and it takes maximum displacement theta naught that is what uh, uh, the measure of the charge passing through that okay and this is what the principle okay? we use in the ballistic galvanometer Now let us go for the construction of the ballistic galvanometer. Okay. Yeah, here you have some torsional uh, head or uh, binding T1. Okay, you have two permanent magnetic poles here. Okay, not the uh, south. Okay, you have some radial uh, magnetic field in between these two. In between these two uh, magnetic poles. Now, uh, you have a rectangular. Coil, okay. Okay, you will have rectangular coil like this, and you will have passpar bronze spring. This is passpar bronze wire. Here you have some small uh, mirror on this uh, passpar bronze wire. Okay. Now the second end of this passpar bronze spring is attached to some another screw, binding screw, okay, yeah, there is a T2 screw, second screw T, T2, first screw uh, T1, say if you may call this as A, B, C, D, R, P, Q, hmm? or as this is a rectangular coil, okay, right, See, current is passing through this coil. Yeah, this is a this is a core of this rectangular coil. Okay. Yeah, you can see the procedure of construction or the construction of uh, ballistic galvanometer on the slide also. Parallelly, you can see uh, there. See, here a rectangular uh, coil. Okay, is placed in the magnetic field due to these two permanent magnetic poles. Okay, these pole edges are in a concave shape. 
in order to produce the radial field inside uniform magnetic field inside the region between these two these two poles okay see this coil is placed in this external magnetic field by using a passport branch wire you can see here over which i have fixed a, a small mirror okay this is the first edge of this transfer branch wire is tied is attached to this rectangular coil one end of the rectangular coil other end of the transfer branch wire is attached to the terminal t1 or the binding screw t1 okay the other end the, the other end of the rectangular coil is attached to the transfer Branch spring, which is in turn attached to the second binding screw T two. Okay, right. Yeah. Now. If you see this T1 and T2, these T1 and T2 screws are on the top portion of the case of this ballistic ballistic galvanometer. Just now we have seen that uh, instrument. Okay, in the image slide. Okay, there you can find two images. One will give you the top view. Another will give you the internal structure of this uh, ballistic galvanometer. But the exact shape of this uh, ballistic galvanometer is uh, like this, right? Inside view, you can see the inside view of the ballistic galvanometer. Exact view of the ballistic galvanometer. Okay. Now this mirror is attached here. Whenever it uh, the coil rotates, it makes some twist in this phosphor branch wire. So that twist causes the mirror to rotate. Okay. Whenever you. Uh, Whenever you, you focus some light on this mirror, then the beam of light will be gets deflected due to the twist in the wire. Then by using the lamp and scale arrangement, we can measure the angle of rotation of uh, uh, this rectangular coil. Okay. Now, what is the core of this uh, rectangular coil? The core of this rectangular coil is non-conducting one. Okay, this is uh, to avoid the uh, effect of the currents. Okay, due to that induction, some damping of the coil takes place. To avoid that, we use non-conducting. That means ivory, or bamboo, uh, core here. Okay, core here. Right. Yeah, if you want, you can see in the image once again. Yeah, you can see the ima image here. This is what uh, the first one in the slide. Okay, left uh, one, first uh, image. Yeah, this is a, uh, okay, top view of this uh, instrument, ballistic galvanometer. Some case is there, you can see. Hmm? Here, uh, some beam is there, okay, to provide for the suspension yeah, here you have the scale okay in this top uh, in this casing okay on this casing you have two screws t1 and t2 for which the wires are attached okay and and end wires of the rectangular wire attached to uh, those screws okay see here uh, in the internal view is here of course, it is not exactly of this instrument, but uh, more or less you will have the same type of internal setup in this uh, instrument. See, north and south, see on the slide, north and south poles are there, rectangular coil is there, okay, core is there, some non conducting material, yeah. Now, the current is uh, passing from one end of the coil to other end of the coil. See, the rotation of the coil can be. Uh, shown on this circular uh, scale. Okay, this you will find this circular scale here on the top of the ballistic galvanometer. Uh, okay, right. This is about the construction of ballistic galvanometer.
Yeah, now let us go for the theory of the ballistic galvanometer, right? Yeah. Now we constructed where we studied the construction of this ballistic galvanometer. All the important parts are uh, appearing here on the board. Okay. Now let us go for the theory of the ballistic galvanometer. Theory of the ballistic galvanometer. Okay, this theory will give you the magnitude of a current passing through this ballistic galvanometer. This ballistic galvanometer. Here, actually, what happens is whenever the charging or discharging of the capacitor takes place, a transient current flows through the circuit. That means displacing of charge over the small period of time. Now, suppose that you want to measure that charge. Okay. That charge can be measured by using the ballistic galvanometer. Okay. Yeah, that is a transient current. That is nothing, that charge is nothing but transient current, current flowing through for a short period of time. Okay. Now, suppose that uh, you are having Yeah. Consider now Consider a, a rectangular coil, say whatever you may be, PQ or S. Okay. Suppose that suppose that I current passing through or uh, this coil okay then you will see the non-zero force on two sides of this rectangular coil right? because two sides are parallel to the magnetic field okay other two sides are perpendicular which sides are parallel top and bottom sides of the rectangular coil are parallel to the uniform magnetic field inside the ballistic galvanometer. So other two sides say you have PQ or S na? okay QR and SP sides okay two sides will be perpendicular to the magnetic field that's why maximum force that that two a couple acts on that rectangular coil. Those two forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Those two forces will cause the rotation of the rectangular coil. Yeah. Then what is the measurement for the, that rotation torque? Yeah. What must what might be the torque acting in this case? I will write here torque. This torque is due to two non-zero forces. Okay. Torque acting on the rectangular coil oh, torque acting on the rectangular coil tau is equal to tau is equal to in the previous class we derived this formula okay actually it is i a b for single turn if you have n turns in the rectangular coil, yeah, you will have the torque tau is equal to n i a b. Okay, here if you want, you write down other terms. N is a number of turns where n is the number of. Okay, I will write here where. Where n is a number of turns, a is a a is a area. 
area of the coil okay area of each turn next what is b b is the magnetic field or magnetic induction inside the turn or external magnetic field inside the ballistic galvanometer b is a magnetic uh, field b is a magnetic field we are already mentioned about this i okay we are supposing that i current is flowing through that ballistic galvanometer so you have torque tau is equal to n i a b okay yeah see well, this current is passing through a very short uh, period of time this current is passing through the coil for a very short period of time this will cause some impulse on the coil okay it will cause angular impulse on the coil why because it is rotating it is not at the time yeah we, we do not have the uh, translatory motion so this impulse is the angular impulse so what is the angular impulse now suffered by this coil now the angular impulse received by the coil is the angular impulse is equal to what is a trans impulse in translatory motion force into time okay here instead of force you have in rotatory motion you have torque here torque into again time is same dt is very small time dt okay now what will be the total angular pulse received by this rectangular coil over the time t entire time period okay total angular therefore total angular impulse total means you have to add all these small impulses over the time t to dt okay now this is to you can see here mm. yeah you see here impulse is to dt on the board now total impulse is 0 to integral 0 to t to to dt okay to dt yeah right now what is the total value of this expression you substitute for tau here this is equal to integral 0 to t what is tau just now we wrote uh, n uh, i a b dt okay this is equal to zero to t and i no n a b otherwise uh, yeah you write separately i dt okay now what is i dt according to the definition of current dq by dt dq by dt since i write here since i is equal to dq by dt charge per time yeah what is what will be this i dt dq is equal to i dt so now you can substitute dq for i dt in the last expression okay now i will substitute this value here yeah so total angular impulse what will be the total angular impulse now total angular impulse is equal to 0 to t and a b of course these are the constants here you have to write instead of i dt you have to write dq okay dq right this is equal to 
we take n a b outside 0 to t uh, d q 0 to t d q ok what is this n a b d q integral d q means it is a q over the time so n a b q n a b q therefore what is total angular impulse now therefore Yeah, you can see here hmm. yeah what is the total angular impulse total angular impulse is equal to n a b q n a b q so what is total angular impulse n a b q n a b q right but this uh, angular impulse is changing the angular momentum of the rectangular coil so this angular impulse because this angular impulse is providing the change in the angular momentum so whatever the angular momentum change in the angular momentum that is occurred for the rectangular coil that must be equal to this angular impulse this angular impulse now this total angular impulse is providing the change of angular momentum so this must be equal to the angular momentum since total angular impulse is equal to change in the angular momentum change in the angular momentum we have okay n a b q is equal to what is the formula for the uh, angular momentum I omega I is the moment of inertia of that coil rectangular coil and omega is its angular velocity okay suppose that this much uh, total angular pulse is providing this uh, angular velocity then this angular pulse is equal to I omega because these two things are uh, equivalent quantities impulse and uh, Okay, angular momentum n a b q is equal to i omega okay right now say this is equation number one this is the one equation we got as a part of the theory what we have done so far we just took the start acting on the rectangular coil and then we calculated the angular impulse then we calculated the total angular impulse yeah. then we equated yeah. this with the change in the angular momentum or angular momentum of the rectangular coil okay this is one part of this uh, theory see what happened finally what happens finally in this instrument actually whenever there is no charge or current flowing through the ballistic galvanometer you have rectangular coil in a stationary position okay whenever you allow the current pass through the rectangular coil it just starts rotating with some angular velocity omega finally it comes to the rest finally it comes to the rest okay yeah then what is happening there its kinetic energy you are having maximum it starts rotating with maximum kinetic energy and finally its kinetic energy becomes zero its kinetic energy becomes zero it, it is what the point where the pointer stops okay yeah now how much change is there in the rotational kinetic energy of the coil initial or final here initial kinetic energy is a high 
final kinetic energy is zero low. That's why what will be the change in the kinetic energy of the coil due to this uh, angular impulse? The change in the kinetic energy is just uh, half i omega square. Okay, where this energy is going? Decrease in the kinetic energy is taking place. Actually, uh, this must this might have converted into some this energy might have converted into some other forms. Either it or it must be stored within that uh, instrument or within the Aspar brand wire. As the coil starts rotating, what happens there? Some twist in the Aspar brand wire happens. So your energy, your kinetic energy is here transferring to the twist of that Aspar brand wire. See the rectangular coil is expanding all of its energy to make the maximum twist in the passwire branch wire. So, uh, of course, you have work energy theorem, okay? Suppose that you are doing some work on the system, then that work must be equal to the change in its kinetic energy, okay? Here, beforehand, we are taking the change, we are observing the uh, change in the kinetic energy. Later on, we will be looking for the work where it is expanded, okay? Right. See, it is used in making twists in the phosphor branch wire. Okay, some work is done on the phosphor branch wire. Okay, this energy is utilized for that work. You know the change in kinetic energy? That is half I omega square, which you can see on the slide. Yeah, otherwise I will write here, initial, what is the initial kinetic energy? Is equal to half of I omega square. What's the final kinetic energy? Kinetic energy it is zero. So what is the change in the kinetic energy? I will write here. Change in the kinetic energy. Change in the kinetic energy is equal to half of i omega square minus 0 okay is equal to half of i omega square right now this much of energy is used to make some twists in the phosphor branch wire okay right how much see Torque required for the unit couple. Let us assume that. Assume that C is a couple. Of, okay, a torque required for unit twist. Okay. For theta twist, okay, then how much uh, <coughs> this torque is needed for theta twist? For theta twist, see theta torque is needed. Okay, so here we want to calculate the work. Okay. This torque is showing the rotation of that passport drawn wire. What is the corresponding work? Yeah, let us remember this first equation. Okay, M A B Q is equal to I omega. Right. Yeah, now the work done on the passport drawn wire. The work done on passport branch wire is equal to the translatory motion you have work is equal to force into displacement that is a translatory displacement ordinary displacement here in the place of work you have torque 
into displacement is here angular displacement angular displacement so this is equal to what is the torque how much torque c theta okay into angular displacement suppose that your coil is rotating through d theta then what will be the work done the work done is c theta d theta okay just you write c theta and d theta this is equal to c theta d theta okay suppose that you are uh, maximum twist is theta naught then what will be the total work done on the pass power branch wire let us see now yeah then what will be the total work done on this pass power branch wire for the maximum uh, rotation total work the total you can see this on the slide also the total work is equal to integral of this thing for dt work needed for d theta twist so what is the maximum displacement or the maximum twist 0 to theta naught okay for this much twist you have to calculate the work done okay so here hmm. this is c is constant anyway what is the integration of theta theta square by 2 with the limits 0 to theta naught. So, your total work will be half of C theta naught square. This is the expression for, uh, for total work. How much is the total work? Otherwise, I will write here half of C theta naught square. Half of C theta naught square. Yeah. Now, you have the change in kinetic energy as half a I omega square then the total work as half c theta square then by using the work energy theorem you have therefore I will write here since okay change in uh, kinetic energy is equal to work done then what you have half of i omega square is equal to half of c theta naught square. So you have this relation, right? Half of i omega square, this is the change in the kinetic energy is equal to the total work done on the system that is pass power branch wire. So you half of cancel. Now you ha just have i omega square or you can see this on the slide also c theta naught square let us call this as equation number two what is your equation number one okay what is your equation number one now we want the equation number one also okay yeah N A B Q is equal to what is our equation? I will write here uh, your equation number one again. Otherwise, I will write here. Otherwise, I will write like this using equation one. What is that? N A B Q is equal to I omega. Okay, I will check this. We already got this formula NABQ is equal to I omega. We call this as equation number 1. Now, square this equation and divide with equation number 2. Okay. Squaring equation 1 and uh, dividing by equation number 2, we have okay after squaring one and uh, dividing it with the equation number two we have see what happens when you square this one and square a square b square q square is equal to i square omega square next what is your second equation this one is 
Okay. So just write LHS as RHS and all LHS as LHS. You interchange these terms and then divide. Yeah. Now, see on this side we have I omega squares. That's why I'm writing this on this side. I omega square. Okay. Now on this side you have okay. We are interchanging LHS or HS now. Right. I omega are here, so I am writing this term here. Okay, now you divide uh, this side with the C theta naught square. Right. Now I am dividing with the equation number 2. Okay. <laughs> now you are only left with I on this side. Okay. So what is your I now? Therefore, I will write here. Therefore, I is equal to how much you are getting? N square, A square, B square, Q square by C theta naught square. Okay. Yeah. So, what is I from this formula? From by doing these manipulations, that means using 1 and 2. You got another equation for i, expression for i, that is i is equal to n square a square b square q square by c theta naught square, right? Now, let us uh, try to find uh, the, what is this i actually, moment of energy of the rectangular kind. Let us try to find this i some, by some another means and let us try to equate uh, that expression with this expression in order to get the q, okay, in order to get the q. Right. Now let us take uh, one formula for the yeah time period of the rotating uh, coil. Time period. of the rotating coil is you have the formula for the time period of the rotating coil as t is equal to how much 2 pi under root of i by c okay see this is a restoring couple of the couple of c hmm? Now, let us try to find I from this uh, equation. So, square on both sides, you have t square is equal to 4 pi square into I by C. So, what will be your I? Therefore, I is equal to t square by 4 pi square, t square by t square by 4 pi square i is equal to t square c by 4 pi square. You can see this on the slide also t square c by 4 pi square. Okay. See, if you designate this with the number 3 and this with number 4, from equations 3 and 4, from equations 3 and 4, we have, okay, actually i is equal to this much from 3. From 4, this i is equal to t square c by 4 pi square. So, just uh, write t square c by 4 pi square in the place of i here now, okay. So, I am substituting this i value here, then you have t square c by 4 pi square is equal to this much. Okay, from 3 and 4 equations, you got this thing. Okay, now let us try to interchange some terms here. Yeah, you just write, just keep these two terms t square by 4 pi square on this side and take this c to this side. Then what happens? T square by 4 pi square is equal to n square a square b square q square by c into c 
c square theta naught square. Okay. Uh, you see this expression on all the, on both LHS and RHS, you have all the square terms. So, if you take square root on both sides, then you have, uh, this way, this I am writing R. Yeah, this is, uh, after making square root, this is t by 2 pi is equal to, this is without squares. Okay, n a b q by c theta naught. Now, yeah, but you want q, that's why take q on one side, c. Now, therefore, t by 2 pi into, it is already here, we are keeping q on this side. We try to bring the rest of the terms to RHS side, RHS or LHS side, c theta naught by n a b c theta naught by c uh, what is here q is equal to q is equal to uh, t by 2 pi by n a b into theta naught otherwise you just uh, uh, write this aside c by n a b into theta naught okay See, by using this uh, expression, just manipulating this thing, you get q is equal t by 2 pi into c by n a b into theta naught, into theta naught. See, what is this? These are all the constant terms, okay. This we call as a k, k, okay, into theta. We call this... Uh, we call this uh, k as a galvanometer constant, where, where k is the galvanometer constant, okay, galvanometer constants. It depends upon the given galvanometer, okay, it is a meter specific t. We need not to bother about this. We just have to take this value from the table of the, from the data of the instrument and you have to multiply with the uh, deflection to maximum deflection. That will give you the charge passing through the ballistic galvanometer. Charge passing through the ballistic galvanometer. Yeah, what is K here? I will write here. Yeah. Your k is, here I am writing where k is equal to t by 2 pi into c by n a b. Okay, what is this? This is a galvanometer constant. So, this is nothing but q. If you want to remove this proportionality constant, you have to put the proportional symbol. Okay, proportionality symbol. This is equal to theta naught. This is a final expression. We are needed in the part of this theory, theory part. If you know the specifications of the galvanometer, you can calculate this uh, k value. Then you have to multiply this k with the maximum displacement of the coil. Okay, then you will get the. So in this way, you can measure the charge passing through that ballistic galvanometer. So what is your conclusion? What the theory says? The theory of ballistic galvanometer says that the charge flowing through the ballistic galvanometer, where do you place this ballistic galvanometer? Wherever you want to measure the transient current or the charge flowing through uh, the circuit, then you put this ballistic galvanometer there. Then it will give you the quantity of charge flowing through that circuit. Okay, right. So that is nothing but that is proportional to. You are just placing this ballistic galvanometer and noting down the maximum uh, displacement of the pointer. Okay, that maximum displacement of the pointer is the measurement of the charge flowing through that ballistic galvanometer.
So, more the deflection of the ballistic galvanometer, more the charge is flowing through the ballistic galvanometer. So, the deflection is smaller than the very small amount of charge he is passing through. And what is the meaning of that? Very small amount of charge he is passing through that ballistic galvanometer. This is what the theory of a ballistic galvanometer. Yeah, you see here on the slide also, the same thing is there. Yeah. Q is proportional to theta naught, where K is a yeah, K is a galvanometer constant. Okay, so what is the meaning of this Q is proportional to theta naught? Charge flowing through the galvanometer is directly proportional to the maximum deflection of the ballistic galvanometer. Ballistic galvanometer. Yeah, this can be uh, measured by using the lamp and the scale arrangement. It is an auxiliary part of the apparatus, okay. The test is reflected in the rotation of the mirror, capital M, attached to that pass bar branch by that rotation. That means the rotation of the wire, twist in the wire, that means rotation of the mirror can be known by using the lamp and a scale arrangement, okay. We are focusing some light on that mirror, whenever there is a twist in the wire, uh, automatically that mirror rotates, so that beam also rotates twice as that of uh, the mirror. Yeah, uh, that is uh, the different thing. So, by using that lamp, then by taking the meter scale, you are measuring how much deflection of the beam is taking place. Then according to that reading, you will find the theta. That means rotation in, actual rotation in the coil. There is a rotation of the beam. You want to find the actual rotation uh, in the coil, okay, right. Then, at this automatically we gives you the charge flowing through that ballistic galvanometer. Okay, let us stop with this. Thank you.